Man, I can't believe it's August 1993. Have you heard about this whole Ruth Bader Ginsburg thing? I think she's had some staying power. She's definitely my favorite Supreme Court Justice. Is she? Name two others. Thurgood Marshall. Also, Bob Justice. So, what are we, what are we thinking of watching? Jurassic Park came out uh, two months ago, and it's blowing our minds, and now I don't know what else we're going to see, but is, is it going to blow our minds as much as that movie did? I mean, I hope these ticket prices never go up from four seventy five. Uh, guys, guys, uh, uh, enough. All right, I think I found our movie. What, Hard Target? N- what? No, listen, look, you like adventure, right? Well, yeah. And you like comedy? Well, yeah, who doesn't love to laugh? Well, then how do you feel about ninjas? Wait, are they turtles? What? Or your stance on surfing? I'm not sure I follow. Guys, we're watching Surf Ninjas. Ah. Whoa! That brings us into the first episode of Screen Refresh, or second episode, depending on when we air this order. We're kind of playing it fast and loose, like Fox did with Firefly, or Fox did with Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Or, so we're going to have like three episodes and we're going to stop? Yeah, or we're going to have three episodes, but we're going to play the last one first, the second one in the middle, and so on and so forth. It's pretty, pretty much what Fox did with everything. Almost human, enlisted. Uh, other things. So welcome back. If it's first time listening, uh, we are a podcast that goes over some of the movies we grew up on, some of the movies we didn't grow up on. We just eventually ended up seeing some of the ones that we feel aren't widely discussed. Some of the ones that need a little extra love and just hoping somebody out there ends up either enjoying it or giving something a shot and finding something new. So I am your host, Tim Fenoya. To my left is my other co-host, uh, Nick Rivera. Yo. And to my far, far left out in the land of California is our other co-host, Dean Fisher. Good evening or whatever time you're listening to this. That time, <laughs> that greeting that's appropriate. So we'll, we're actually going to do it like Clue. We're going to film five intros where Dean is going to give various <laughs> times a day that he's welcome you to. Um, and then just play whichever one kind of applies. You can collect them all. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be like the uh, when they did the all the movie tie ins for McDonald's, like the what was it? The Matt Man Forever glass frosted mugs that they did. Oh, yeah. Those were coveted. I had a, I, I had a couple of those. I don't know which ones. I was partial to the Flintstone ones myself. I still miss those. So for any of you unaware, we the episode we're opening with is Surf Ninjas from 1993. Uh, essentially, it is a film about uh, two children and one Rob Snyder who ends up learning that they are involved with a mystical ninja based island and their royalty and there's there's a lot going on with it uh it opened up in august of 93 against jean-claude van damme's hard target uh and following up a bang up august of jason goes to hell the final friday the fugitive uh searching for bobby fisher stephen king's needful things and heart and souls um some i would say better films some i would say not better films uh, leave that up to you. Better than Surf Ninjas? <laughs> I think that's the best one out of that whole list. Really? Out of that group? That's the only one I saw. You haven't seen uh, Heart and Souls? Robert Downey Jr.? No. Oh, I, I haven't seen Hard Target, but I want to imagine it might be better than Edge Out Surf Ninjas. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> well, join Dean Fisher on our sister podcast, Jean-Claude Van Damme, That's a Good Movie, when he reviews Hard Target next week. Yes. <laughs> That's a podcast I do. <laughs> a couple of those are they're, they're worth finding. Um, I personally have never seen. Uh, well, I haven't seen Hard Target. I haven't seen Searching for Bobby Fisher. But overall, August seems like a solid month. Uh, Jason Goes to Hell was not the best of the Friday the 13th movies by a long shot. Did Stephen King direct Needful Things or is that just a. No, his it, name it was, was just, attached kind of like. Yeah, 
the rest it was just of his one movies. of his. Yeah, because he doesn't have a great directing track record. I don't think, right? Um, yeah, the Shining didn't do all that well. Yeah, at he the directed time. The Shining, right? No, he did. Um, Stanley Kubrick did The Shining. He did. No, well, he, he did, did his, his own his version. Own version yeah. of The Shining, like a TV. Oh, the, was it the TV version or was yeah, it like the a, one with Stephen Weber? I enjoyed the one with Stephen Weber. It was just a little more drawn out because it's the the TV version. But yeah, I think the only one I know of that he himself directed was um, oh god, the, the one Mac with Emilio truck. Estevez. Yes. Yeah. I was just the trying to think Duck of that. Man? The Mighty Duck Man himself. God damn it. Yeah. It's going to drive you crazy. I keep thinking I know- Duel, just because that has a Mack truck, but or a truck, that, that's not it. At some point, I know we've discussed it several There's times. There's a Green Goblin semi-truck, and uh, he's the leader of the evil machines, essentially. Yeah, that movie. You know, if, you, if you've seen it, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> it's, anyway, it, that yeah, was kinda, was, that's a kind of fun movie. It was Maximum movie. Overdrive in 1986. Maximum Overdrive. It's a fun, dumb movie. I mean, where else are you going to see Little Leaguers getting literally steamrolled by a, a steamroller gone, gone haywire? Yeah, it, it was surprisingly violent for, <laughs> well, I was going to say for its time, but I feel like there was other stuff violent that time too. Yeah. Um, so overall, stuff worth searching out during this month. I would definitely check out Surf Ninjas, definitely check out Heart and Souls, Rap Downey Jr. He's a, a baby or something like that. A bunch of people end up in a bus crash. Their souls can't go on to heaven, so they end up kind of tying themselves to him. So he ends up seeing all of these spirits that help him over the years. So it's like Tom Sizemore and whatnot, um, Charles Grodin. Um, uh, yeah, check it out. Are so you, overall, are you definitely recommending Surf Ninjas? I am I. Yeah, are you Nick? I got you guys to watch it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> You not only got us to watch it, but you got us. We're going to be talking about it for 90 minutes. We are. Yeah, it has merits. Yeah, overall. Um, so first time seeing it myself and at first, like 10 minutes in, I didn't know how to feel about it. By middle to end of the movie, I decided uh, I'm on board with Surf Ninjas. It's fun. I could dig it. I don't know what the the first experience is or how you guys uh, first came into Surf Ninjas. I know, Nick, it, it goes way back for you, right? Yeah, I didn't appreciate it until adulthood. A lot of those jokes, I didn't... I mean, like, watching a movie when you're a kid, it didn't really have much impact on me. It had the same impact as, like, the Turtle movies did. So, watching it, I just took it at face value, and it's just, like, cool scenes with a movie, just stitching those scenes together with, like, all of the martial arts and whatnot. But I had no investment into, like, acting or, you know, actual plot. It's just like, oh, cool, they're fighting. Like, oh, there's a Game Gear. That's awesome. And that's really all I had going for it. (laughs) But now, yeah, huge difference. Yeah, because the Game Gear thing, um, I guess originally Sega funded part of the movie. So the Game Gear ended up being featured heavily, um, which is why it becomes its own plot point, Um, which I think the movie would still function without it, but it would be kind of weird. It's like the wizard without the power glove. Do you ever have a Game Gear? Oh, no, I didn't. You needed six batteries to run that thing. <laughs> so six, for the kids to be playing batteries? It, <laughs> si, si, no, six. It was either six or eight AA batteries. You have to walk around with like the backpack like Gary Busey and Predator 2 to play it. So this kid playing it in the middle of like Malaysia, like, man, either his backpack is full of batteries or it really is a magical Game Gear. <laughs> It made me kind of nostalgic for the days of like, I miss being able to just carry around. I had the Game Boy um, Pocket at the time. That's what was around when I got into the handheld stuff. Um, but I kind of miss that of just having that thrown into your bag or thrown into your well pocket um, and just playing that on the go. I know like the Switch nowadays and I have that, but it's for some reason it's still it feels different than that era. I never had a handheld system. My friend had a Game Gear and... It had Mortal Kombat on it, and that was like the only reason I was interested because and I you was carried his obsessed batteries? with that game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I never got to play. I was a walking fire hazard. Oh, child, you know there's a there's a Jurassic Park game on it. No, it was actually pretty good. Well, it's one of the few Jurassic Park iterations I have not seen. Yeah, because I wonder, was that the same one? There was one I I grew up on for I think it was Super Nintendo. Where you're, it's top down and you're going around the park, but then when you go into the buildings, it goes into first person. 
Now that one's based on the Nintendo version. Oh, okay. The NES. Now this one is um, like Contra style shooter. Oh, weird. I'll say that I saw Surf Ninjas probably. I don't think I saw this in a the theater. It was probably a VHS rental uh, TV kind of movie, probably VHS. So I remember bits and pieces of it, like the aforementioned Game Gear that has magical powers, or so it seems. Um, when I was watching the opening credits, I was surprised. I was like, oh, Ernie Ray's senior father son duo with Ernie Ray's junior. And er Ernie Ray's is listed as an associate producer. Yeah. I was going to say, I think maybe his producing credit was calling his dad and being like, hey, dad, do you want to do this movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you want to choreograph the stunts too? All, all the fighting? Yeah. Yep. I'm an associate producer. Yeah, I was really surprised. I I know I should have expected it, but I wasn't expecting the choreography to be fun. The actual action scenes to be kind of it reminded me of all those fun early 90s action movies. Um, but considering that it's the two of them and I know Ernie Ray's Jr. did a lot of the the stunt work and did a lot of the choreography work for other things. Um, that's kind of fun to see that um, even though he might personally have not done I don't remember him in a ton of stuff aside from the behind the scenes thing he did. I know Ernie Ray's Jr. Um, around that time, he did Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon that he was in. Um, he was the prince in Red Sonia back when he was real little. Wait, and then he I had think, something to do with The Last Dragon? Yeah, he was in The Last Dragon. Ernie Ray's I don't Jr. I remember that. OK. Yeah. He's one of the students that gotcha. um, at um, Bruce Leroy's school bruce leroy <laughs> he was in the first turtle movie too with the the first one or the second one the first one. Oh, he was in the first he was donatello oh so that makes sense because then they had him do kino in the the second one and i think the most recent thing i saw him in was uh the rundown with the rock but uh, other than that oh, not much. I, I know, i've seen that movie but i don't recall it's been such a long time yeah he seems to do more of the the background work and do more of the the prep for everybody else um, but he's still involved in everything. So it's fun seeing him. I'd like to see him in another movie. He had good screen charisma throughout this and especially his Kino over in TMNT 2. Yeah, it kind of threw me off the, the opening to this movie because it's it goes right into kind of the the fun 90s surfer thing. And I immediately see Ernie Ray's Jr. and see his character and immediately think this is just a carryover of Kino from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because it's you can just cherry pick that character and put right into here. Um, but it to me, it felt like uh, rocket power with ninjas. <laughs> we are riders. Uh, whatever. <laughs> that song. <laughs> Didn't the offspring do that? Do that uh, intro? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> Something worth checking. Somebody Did, please fact check. Us. Was Ninja Turtles. Was that 92, 91? The second one. I think 93. So it came out the same year. Maybe. I didn't do any type of fact checking like that. I'd no, we, I just... we do it live. <laughs> Everything is just our, our raw natural talent. We have a producer, an assistant producer in the next room, and they're <laughs> constantly looking things up for us. <laughs> it's our interns. So he had a big year in 93, this. So he was the, the star of this, and then he had... I guess, human star of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Two came out in 91. So more oh, okay. likely he was a hit and like, all right, put him in a new movie. Yeah, and it so took this him got him this to... probably. That yeah. got him this movie, Surf Ninjas, as far as a appearing role. So how did you guys feel about the opening with them commuting through Santa Monica <laughs> with the paddles in the Jeep? I wish moto surfing was a trend that continued. I think this was better than planking and the parkour crap that came out a couple years ago. <laughs> so Santa Monica crowd, please bring back this and Jeeps. I wanted to back up to the breakfast scene with dad. Uh, it's well, we're past it now. Too they're, right. no, <laughs> they're adopted. Uh, adoptive father. Um, he goes, he's going through like a whole spiel like, oh, I love you, dad. Like, psych. <laughs> <laughs> like oh you really don't 1993 was the height of psych <laughs> but he's like he, he he 
he's faking out his dad because what did he do? He's like not. Then he have breakfast. They talk about homework. Then they fight. Right, and then he's just like, oh, "I love you, dad." And then he's like, "Psych." Like, I guess he doesn't love his father. Like, or he never. I don't s- love you. It's all a sham. <laughs> he goes back on it. <laughs> So he's like, he tells them they can't make a living on surfing. They need a fallback option, like an art history degree or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or open a, uh, a surf side restaurant like Mac did and see how far it gets you. It, I mean, that really does feel like rocket power. I'm assuming rocket <laughs> power probably saw surf ninjas and was like, yeah, that, but take out all the ninjas. Too violent. Too violent. And then, well, the ninjas attacked. Are they attacking at like 10 a.m. on a, on a Monday morning? Are they trying to kill them? Well, yeah. They're in a hurry. This way they can still <laughs> leave the rest of their day open. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just <laughs> They've got things to do. They've got other people to kill. I like how far they went. And they even disguised themselves as like the garbage men. <laughs> in order to try to tailgate them. Like they went pretty far and were so heavily infiltrated into our own infrastructure. I was just going to say, how long have they been like getting into Santa Monica's waste management system? Like just for this one hit. <laughs> Cause these kids, these kids have been gone for years since they were very, very young children. So yeah. they had to have been so, plotting I mean, this for a long time. And then for them to get involved in all of these different jobs and municipal workers and all these things, it's like the key and peel thing. Yeah, we're going to go into that bank and I have the best idea. So first, we're going to start doing some work week to by week. And slowly but surely, we're going to just take that money out every two weeks. Yeah, that's a job. <laughs> <laughs> they probably started families like they're really ingrained into this <laughs> second life they built for themselves. Yeah, for Zatch to just break all their necks. Yeah, like the boss calls them. It's like, today's the day. And it's like, you know, they kiss their wives and maybe children goodbye and it's like i I don't know if i'm coming home (laughs) it could get blown up in a quote-unquote gas leak house explosion (laughs) hey spoilers we're not there yet (laughs) yeah it was because i don't want to get ahead of ourselves but those guys are definitely dead (laughs) there's so many points in this movie that i'm like it's a kid's movie but i mean that guy has to be dead right (laughs) yeah i just wanted to address their psyching their dad out of loving him and why the these ninjas were attacking in broad daylight on in the morning yeah wearing digital blue camo ninjas quote unquote yeah that didn't, <laughs> didn't blend in with any like call of duty dlc pack camo the kids do like to surf so at least they have the blue camo right because they didn't see them in the water <laughs> that's true that's right that's right they did try to get killed in the water yep that harpoon gun that would be so effective <laughs> You know, the, the perfect ninja weapon, a harpoon. You need something that is effect. You could work in the water. Could have had a throwing star, but you don't have any. Can't get any oomph without your lower body, you know. Weaponized shark. <laughs> but the, the motor surf. Yeah. That, the way those kids get caught, like the cop has caught them motor surfing. <laughs> like, is it like an epidemic? Like, is that the third leading cause of death among children in... The Santa Monica area, like motors. Is it illegal to have like paddle boards in the back of your of your car? Yeah, like, what without if you get pulled over and you're just you actually just boat in your spare time. Right. You're just heading to your boat at that moment. I think it's just because Rob Schneider's Iggy character had priors. They probably had a warrant. <laughs> I mean he dyes his hair like a criminal. Like that's a criminal hair hairstyle. Yeah. It looks like it was freshly dyed, like he just maybe robbed a bank and like, I need to change appearance. He probably had a beard before this, too. <laughs> they don't address it, but that's not their actual friend. The other kid goes missing. He just shows Rob up. Schneider. I, I was confused. I thought he was just a friend, but he's definitely going to school with them, like with a backpack on. Yeah, he was <laughs> he's, he's 29. Yeah, I looked it up. <laughs> He was 29 or 30 when this was filmed. Like, granted, Ernie Reyes Jr. was 21 when this was filmed, but like... That's passable, for still, sure. Yeah, he looks youthful enough. <laughs> At first, I thought Rob Schneider was like, oh, like, he must be the assistant to Mac or something, like their father figure, and all. Oh, he helps out with them, and it's like, nope, it's just another kid they met at school. That his family hates. They don't know why they keep him around. So, speaking of school, so they did the whole scene... Not a bad rendition of uh, Bob Aran, even though it's Bob, Bob, 
Baba Ram, Baba Ron, Baba Ron, Baba Ron. To this day, that's the only thing I think of when I hear Baba Ann. <laughs> At least for the next couple times I hear it, that's the only thing I'm going to think of. Was Ernie Ray's was his character's Johnny? Was Johnny the only Asian student at the school? Like it seemed like he was handpicked because he was Asian to do this presentation <laughs> to the Asian VIP. <laughs> like is he? The, he's probably one of the worst students. It seems like, but they picked him to do it for some reason. Well, it was either that or Rob Schneider, but he had graduated fourteen years before. You you can't tell me there's not more Asians at a California school. I don't know. Anyway. So they do Baba Ran, and then they cut over to Adam over in his class trying to point out the countries on the map. <laughs> and they cut to that one kid with the glasses who's, fly. who's <laughs> laughing at him. And like, <laughs> it's, it's the first time in the movie I'm listening to this kid laugh and I see his face and I'm like, he looks older than Rob Schneider. This is the first <laughs> time that I'm like, OK, now I understand why the other guy passes. Nobody's calling him out because this kid looks like he's 40. That's a good technique by the movie to let you, to immerse you in that idea. Like, it's okay because everybody else is 40. So 30, yeah. he's actually pretty young for this. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Schneider's in the, uh, the junior class. Did you notice the guy, so the ninja dump truck pulls up outside during this whole presentation. Did you know the, the guy that get out is very Broadway. He got out and opened <laughs> the door <laughs> doing his pose. He just seemed like he was... He, this was his one shot to like do something on screen, and god damn it, he like he posed <laughs> after getting opening that door. If you show up late to this movie, mom and dad, you better come. <laughs> Gonna come out here with some zazz. Wonder if he got any more, any more, work, any more work after that. Yeah. So as far as the the whole school thing, um, I think it sets the the kids up nicely. Um, as far as I still don't know, Rob Schneider's involvement with any of that school system. Um, but it's that when around that, when we actually get our first look of the evil fortress with uh, Colonel Chi, yes. what it does the, the cutback at first when this popped up and I see like the torture chamber and whatnot, and you hear the guys screaming and I'm like, this is actually kind of dark. And then they do that stupid phone gag. <laughs> <with Leslie Nielsen. laughs> I, I think that is one of the best bits of the movie. I think this movie is severely lacking more Leslie Nielsen as Dr. Doom as the T-800. <laughs> um, yeah, that kill. I thought it was dumb at first, but I don't know. I just, I, I love him so much. Rewatching it, I'm really convinced that him and Raul Julia both graduated from the same like villain academy. <laughs> <laughs> because I can easily see his bison right next to Colonel Chi. Colonel like, it would work. That's the movie I would watch. Like the two of them growing up like Harry Potter over the years, just at the Villain Academy. But I feel like even if I'm laughing at it, and it's a dumb scene that ruins the tension, I still laughed at it. So it's Leslie Nielsen. Yeah, I thought this was the highlight of the movie so far for me when this came on, the, the, the gag. I was actually laughing at it when he was like, are you, did you call and hang up? And then he's like, <laughs> just throws the phone. <laughs> like, I actually want to go back and rewatch that just scene the, just for that. Yeah. Just the concept that he has. He had, a, he had some of the machine. best lines. His, be, his, my favorite one is toward the end of the movie from him. I know evidently. So reading some of the backstory on the behind the scenes stuff, Leslie Nielsen avoided spending time with the rest of the cast and whatnot to try to keep himself intimidating and scary to the kids. So I don't know if they showed the kids the dailies for any of that stuff prior to them meeting Leslie Nielsen then, because I, I don't I don't think you can stay on eat lunch by yourself as much as you want. But if they seen the phone gag, I don't think they're going to be intimidated by him anymore. I don't think they ever were intimidated by him. No. Yeah, I don't know if this is the kind of the movie that needs like method uh, preparation. <laughs> yeah, th this isn't it. <laughs> Leslie Nielsen isn't doing the Pennywise method. He was trying to break off. He was trying to uh, do something I different. Th yeah, or I think it's just his excuse on he doesn't want to hang out with a bunch of kids in 1993. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. I don't want to be involved. I want to keep this intimidating. So I'm not going to talk to either of those two kids or Rob Schneider the entire film. 
You know, I think he was probably one of the highlights to the movie. Oh, yeah, he definitely Absolutely. always he doesn't take himself is, seriously and it adds fun. And I think this was his best movie to date. Ooh. I mean, I'm going to hard dis hard disagree. Airplane had come out. So did the naked gun. No, not Leslie Nielsen. I mean, Rob Schneider. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, I don't know if I really pound for pound <laughs> airplane against I'm glad, surf. I'm glad bitches. that's not how you feel. Nick. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I mean, Mr. Magoo was better than this in terms of Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> um, what was Schneider in before this? Did he was he in anything? I know his run with Adam Sandler hadn't started. Yeah, I don't know. This was this would have been his, his super debut. early in his career. Oh, so he came out of the gate swinging on Surf Ninjas. <laughs> his first movie, it was his best movie to date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, actually, before that. So he had just done Home Alone 2. Um, oh, that was a big release. Even though, yeah. Oh, which, he was like the bellhop at the yeah, hotel. Yeah. Right? That's right. Um, and have you ever seen Necessary Roughness? Is that a football movie? No. Yes. It is. Yeah. Um, it's the, the football comedy with Scott Bakula. <laughs> No. But yeah, it's that one you should check out at some that, point. I that mean, feels it's, like it's a bunch it's a, of people. I walked by it at Blockbuster a lot and just remember that it's a movie. And and now Scott Bakula, that rings a bell too, but no, yeah. I haven't seen it. It's uh, Scott Bakula and his team is Sinbad, Jason Bateman, and Rob Schneider. Um, and then it has the coaches, Hector Elizondo and Robert Loggia. I just, I haven't seen it in ages. I just remember enjoying it. Uh, maybe at maybe at some point I should go back and rewatch that one for this yeah. future episode of Screen Refresh. Yeah, during uh, we'll do it in February for the Super Bowl. We'll do football movies. It'll be this and uh, the replacements with Keanu Reeves. <laughs> the Water Boy. Um, Keep up that Rob Schneider kick. Actually, yeah, that's actually that's the theme that we're looking for in this podcast. Rob we needed Schneider. something to tie it all together. Every movie has some connection to Rob Schneider from now on. Like a six degrees or, yeah. or, or even less degrees. One degree of Rob Schneider. He has to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, he has to star. <laughs> I need top three names on the poster. So, yeah. So the also I like how after the, the Fortress of Evil with the phone gag, my next note is just Rob Schneider's hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling my, you, it's it's mine was just this is Rob Schneider's best movie. <laughs> I, I didn't write down the line, but he must have said something because I just love that whole like "what if" joke oh. throughout the entire movie. Like, well, what if I was a king and you know the, all this stuff happens? And like, oh, what if I lose this power? What did I do? <laughs> yeah, I was actually surprised. Like, I'm not a big Rob Schneider fan in terms of um, a lot of the stuff I've seen, but I did chuckle at a couple of his lines. I'll get to another one later. Um, but yeah, this scene, I think this is the first scene when they they cut from the fortress to them doing the surfing and he's waxing his board, getting ready to go out when he's not actually going to go out. And it was the first time I actually noticed his hair <laughs> in this film. Yeah, it, it's so strange. A weird, like, I, I don't even know how it speaks to his character, really, like the why he needed that hair. But it's because the kid that originally was friends with them in school was a surfer. And now that he's assumed that role, he doesn't surf, so he can never let on. That's why Mac doesn't like him. <laughs> Mac's the only one who remembers the original kid. Ah. Uh, is this one of those, like, the Brady Bunch replacing a kid kind of things? Is, yeah. Surf Ninjas is deeper than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, originally it was supposed to be Jonathan Brandis, and then they decided we're going to go in a different direction and give Rob Schneider. Well, they... So they... The brothers, Adam and Johnny, they go out surfing and then the trash truck ninja brigade shows up again at the beach, still using the trash uh, truck as cover. Well, yeah, but I feel like if you spend the money on the truck. Yeah, you're invested, man. Not to mention the 10 years that we previously talked about that they spent setting this whole thing up. Going to town hall meetings, picketing to be able to get those positions. Get an extra guy on that truck. Joining a union. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they probably had to ask City Hall to make sure there was a route along that specific road. Yeah. I want to see the movie, the prequel to this. That, uh, yeah, those guys' lives getting ready for this assassination. <laughs> it's the, the ninja garbage brigade of Santa Monica. It's going to be like a <laughs> fist with sliced alone. Just 
<laughs> Union busters. I wonder if the the ninjas that survived just stayed behind and just maybe started their own company. I want to see a sequel Voice where management. they're just working at the uh, the restaurant with Mac. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bury the hatchet. <laughs> yeah. The other guys showed up. You blew up a house on them. So, yeah, I'll, I'll sweep floors. At this point, we're so close to having ninjas on surfboards. I mean, I guess we had it in the opening. The ninjas were right there. So maybe we already hit that point for the title line, which I know comes up later. But it's the I mean, you're calling the movie Surf Ninjas, you know? Yeah, I actually don't remember how many scenes had surfing in it or which ones were just B-roll of surfing happening. I think it definitely was a stunt doubles or it wasn't Ernie Reyes Jr. surfing or any of his any of the people we know. Those uh, those shots were not very subtle in trying to hide that it's not the kids actually surfing. <laughs> it's just they have paper masks of the kids over their faces. <laughs> so we end up doing the the whole surf scene, the the garbage ninjas coming out. So this is when they they go to Max. I'm assuming it's yeah. a burger place or yeah, a restaurant of place. some sort. Which I mean, it looks like a place I would go to. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seemed like it's cheap, probably cheap, good, and greasy. Yeah. Combination. It's everything I want. At Subpar a, a, fries and not Heinz ketchup, but it's in the red bottle. But that's okay. Oh, just the generic the burger's okay. red yeah. bottle? Yeah, yeah, it's from, from Cisco, the uh, food company. Yeah. Yeah, I think overall, uh, a seaside burger shack, it's not a bad <laughs> deal. I mean, before all this happens. <laughs> right. This felt this whole brawl that happens at the burger place right now felt very much like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. It gave me like the mall scene opening vibes of just them using stuff in the restaurant and just kind of the, the very confined space fight. I don't get that feeling from the uh, from that scene. I see what you're talking about, but like when I see it, I, I just out of context, I actually think of anything the April O'Neil's antique store vibe more if anything because it's when they get their ass kicked and they gotta bail out oh actually yeah i can see that yeah they're swarmed they're overrun yeah where they're getting beat and then at the end zatch ends up getting the voicemail of mac getting fired from his job and that's gonna come back up later yeah this is where zatch makes his appearance to them right his first like appearance to them to the kids yeah, because this is when he explains the, the All situation. The exposition. Yeah, <laughs> right. <'Cause laughs> in my notes, I have Q spin doctors to princes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what should have been playing. That should would, and then they go to the land of Patusan or Patusan, or and then <laughs> that's just what, and that's just what plays over the entire. Thing. Oh, that's right. The flashback here. Yeah, mm-hmm. is, which I was, was not l- expecting the mass was, murder and gunplay there. <laughs> <laughs> I love how. Um, there is, they're going in there with automatic machine guns, but like everybody's dressed, you know, they've got like, it's like this hand to hand combat still, but there's M16s and players. <laughs> yeah, it, it seemed very haphazard the way that they staged this attack. Hey, Colonel Chi is wise. OK, <laughs> did he have like a motive? Just I want to rule. I don't really remember. I mean, I know his ultimate goal was not to get crushed under an elephant like a store brand shredder. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <oof. laughs> I actually That's have that what this cited. Was missing. Casey Jones. I have that cited. Rem- rem- reminiscent of Shredder dying in the garbage truck. Is this is this a throwback? I mean, overall, not a bad action sequence. And then the ninjas. I mean, the the ninjas have a garbage truck, so I don't know if that's an even you know a different <laughs> kind of connection. You know, back in. Uh... The early 90s when Elias Cotes <laughs> went around all the movies just crushing villains in garbage trucks. <laughs> I can't take Lieutenant Frank Trebin seriously as a samurai. Maybe more. Maybe I can take him more seriously as a cyborg samurai. What did that thing do for his face anyway? Like what? Why was it wired up? <laughs> yeah, because I feel like getting crushed by an elephant. If he has the metal part there, what yeah. happened to his face? Because his face didn't get crushed, I thought. And if I it mean, did, it could be I covering like up. a piece of metal isn't going to put that back together from an elephant. But I feel like it could be covering up, you know, it, it completes the structure of his face because it's gone. But why is it electronic? It's not doing anything. We don't know that. Unless, like, it gives him sight. 
Well, that's bad on the movies, the filmmakers part to have that. In. I think it's a good thing. It's a letting your imagination run wild. Do you want, you know, the problem with Lost was that people asked too many questions. And then when they finally gave you the answer, we got the ending. And the same thing with the force. Like, how does the force work? And George is like midi chlorians. Like, well, maybe I should have asked these questions. And the directors were smart enough to have the foresight to just he's got cyborg stuff on his face because he got crushed by an elephant. You leave it at that and it's like, whoa, okay, I'll take it. Actually, thinking about it that way, it probably works better, like you say, because otherwise around this time, another movie might have decided to do a first person view from his eyes on that side and do like a bad CGI robot view. It'll be like the Terminator site. Well, actually, I didn't mind the Terminator site, but actually, yeah, they should just literally have ripped that entire scene. Does it matter that what he's looking at doesn't match? They just rip the scene and put the footage in directly from Terminator. <laughs> but it's just warning signs of how close he is to water at all times. <laughs> it's just uh, humidity from weather.com. Can anyone find Patusan on a map? I know where Spain isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and when this sequence started, that's the first thing I wondered. Where is where is Padusan on the map? Some Southeast Asian mysterious country. Just off the coast of Santa Monica. It was filmed in Thailand, so maybe it's close to there. Yeah, we'll we'll eventually get there. But that gave me the. Um, it reminded me of Indiana Jones when they do the submarine thing. And all of a sudden you just see the map pop up and they have it going all across the map. Right. Actually, that that that's that brings a good question. Where is Patusan? Because it must be big enough that they have little Patusan in the middle of like downtown Santa Monica. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that's right. We had immigrants. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. What hidden land is this if they have little Patusan? Dean, have you been there? No, no. I'll have to look for it. Yeah. Next time you go. Yeah, I think they have a salt and straw out there. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty, uh, nearby santa monica so i'll give it a look see <laughs> just all the uh the garbage ninjas on break over at an in and out <laughs> so i think is this around the time they come back from the the uh flashback when he gives all the backstory and the the fight there and then this is when tone lock comes in right tone loke tone loke tone as loke. Uh, lieutenant spence um, I think after this, he got typecast as a detective because he plays this same character in Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. <laughs> a um, former a rapper turned detective actor. Because which came out first? Ace Ventura this or did. this? This, this did. came out first. Oh, so this really primed the... So he must have got relocated to the Miami Police Department. Well, it's like Reginald Val Johnson going from Die Hard to Ghostbusters, whichever one came out first and vice versa. And then Family Matters. Yeah, oh, I miss that guy. It could be that's just he's still around. He's not dead. Well, yeah, <laughs> he said he finally retired five days from retirement. He actually did it. <laughs> it worked out. He was never in any real danger. No, I feel it's a shared universe. It's <laughs> it's like the uh, the greater universe or was it the greater combined universe theory from was it St. Elsewhere? That originated yeah ace ventura came out in 94 oh, okay so a year later he just moved to miami because he was sick of the west coast with all them damn ninjas and he got roped into that whole uh, stolen dolphin gig yeah he can't have a normal police detective life it seems and then he was in blank check was he a cop in that no he was a criminal he was juice <laughs> he got sick of the. He, he got sick of all the game. Apparently, like, well, I guess the bad guy's got something better going on. Came a dirty cup, or he was undercover, looking to blow this thing open from the inside. That's a great point. I don't remember the then, plot of Blank Check, but that's what I would ask. That'll. We should watch Blank Check. It is not great. But <laughs> yeah, I don't think it sits in the halls of. No, uh, it, golden it, childhood it, films. It presents it's just like a lot you remember of weird, it coming out yeah, and watching it. It presents a lot of weird things you shouldn't think too hard into. Um, <laughs> but the only other things I remember him in, other than that, was just uh, Titan AE. If you remember the animated one, uh, he was one of the voices in that. And then Heat with De Niro and Pacino. 
Yeah, he has a great voice. You can see why he was had somewhat of a career there after his rap. Oh, you didn't uh, like the wild thing? <laughs> no, I'm saying that's 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 why he got into get those roles because of his voice, probably. Oh yeah. Great voice, Tone Loke. So around this time, it's uh so he shows up and he's gonna put the kids somewhere now that Mac's been captured. Um but they, and this but is they when have they uncle. have Iggy come out with a chaplain mustache <laughs> playing a Scott. <laughs> this is the moment I realized they couldn't get Mike Myers for Iggy, so they had to cast Rob Schneider. Because this Mike Myers is the uh quintessential Scottish person in in any of these movies and i realized oh that was probably why they got that this parts they kept it but it was for mike myers originally that's why he has the red hair it was just to set up for that one joke (laughs) (laughs) wait for some reason so he didn't have a wig in that scene right because i feel like that would have been counterproductive for him to have bright red hair and then put a wig on for a scott thing yeah that's a good point i feel like he had a hat on though oh yeah you're right Then so, (laughs) oh no, you can go ahead with this one. (laughs) I was wondering, like, okay, this is made in '93. I guess kids' movies were still having a bite to them. Um, yeah, he walks out with a stack of nudie mags. (laughs) (laughs) Iggy does comes downstairs from what I assume is like Mac's room (laughs) with the Playboys. It was a different time. Yeah, I mean, I was. I thought, okay, this had some uh, kids' movie bite to it. It's not too G. Yeah. But I think if this was, if this movie was made in the 80s, he would have had a hustler instead of a playboy. It would have been, it was a little harder in the 80s, no pun intended. (laughs) Well, Playboy partially funded this movie after Sega funded it with the Game Gear thing. (laughs) I saw that. I forgot. I saw that in the credits. Yeah, this was a, a double funding effort by Hugh Hefner and Sega. The Playmate of the Year got cut out of the movie. There's a whole storyline with her, but it's, yeah, it didn't, it didn't make the cut. She was originally going to be Zatch. (laughs) Before Ernie Reyes Jr. stepped in and got his dad. It's like, wait, she can't choreograph this movie. (laughs) I would love to see a Playmate of the Year choreographed martial arts scene. (laughs) I'm sure there's something out there. Yeah, I'm sure it's on Pornhub. (laughs) Or an actual legitimate film. Was that uh, the, the topic you thought I was, you were, you had in mind, Tim? It was not okay. at all. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your this... face change uh, once, I, once I brought it up. Also, for anybody listening, we uh, were recording, but Dean and I are, have ourselves on a video cam so we can see each other. It's not just, <laughs> just Dean sees. <laughs> Nick is abstaining from looking at us. He's had enough of us. <laughs> what? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but what were you what were you going to go into, Tim? I mean, I was going to say this is the point in the film where the game gear pops up <laughs> as mm. a major plot point. Well, that's after the Playboys, but yes. Yeah. Cause this is when he ends up so some of those animations seem like a weird kind of animation style. Oh no, um, that was they actually made a game for that whole bit. Oh yeah. So like the actual gameplay, but then it cuts into like the cutscenes on the game gear and it's like a weird Junji Ito facial expression thing. That oh, was kind of yeah. creepy. Yeah. Cuz all of a sudden it's like, "Oh yeah, you're playing a normal side scrolling game and then it cuts over to a 8-bit cutscene of somebody with dead eyes." Yeah, for if you haven't seen the movie, he the younger brother Adam pulls out his game gear to pass the time and all of a sudden what he's seeing on the game gear screen seems to be happening in real life as if it's kind of predicting the future 60 seconds from now. Yeah. And the thing he sees is ninja creep up and kill two cops outside <laughs> <laughs> or just incapacitate. We don't we don't totally see what they do. <laughs> That's true. But considering all the stuff that happens in this film, I I don't know. Until later on, it kind of made me not angry, but I'm like, what what purpose does this serve? It's like a weird, magical, mystical element that all of a sudden he's got a magic game gear. It kind of 
makes sense later on, but uh, it was a weird way to manifest it, and it was not really set up or telegraphed. Um, which I it just seemed strange, like oh, this movie's about has met why it seemed like just easy writing, like it's just we'll give this person a, a a look into the future, but we don't really know why. All of a sudden, his game is magical. Well, I think it might have been. They know Ernie Reyes Jr. can do the the fight choreography and whatnot, and then they have Zatch. They know Rob Schneider's going to be there for quote-unquote comic relief, and they needed something for Adam to end up doing, so I don't know if they just wanted to give him some purpose or something to do while he's there. So it's, oh, you have a psychic game gear. You can call out things for people and help them out that way, because otherwise you're going to be watching what? A, seven eight-year-old kid do karate and fight off ninja by himself right we wouldn't have bought him uh fighting these much older people yeah but it, it just, just comes out of nowhere and it's not really explained or really you realize okay i guess that's why it was magical until you know the third part of the movie third act of the movie yeah because i feel like if it had always been magical it would have told him where spain was <laughs> yeah why where the hell were you in in ge- <laughs> yeah. geography class <laughs> it was busy telling him that there's two garbage and just sneaking in through the windows <laughs> <laughs> i guess arguably better knowledge for the uh the present <laughs> so what did you guys think about so at this point we've had zatch explain that they are both princes that ended up getting sent over here um, with Mac because of stuff that happened back over in their land. And now he has a psychic game gear and now they're trying to get them back to Patasan so they can end up seizing the throne from Colonel Chi. And then Zatch blows up a house, killing a at least nine ninja. <laughs> I had no choice were Zatch's exact words. <laughs> he had no choice but to blow up a house full of people. <laughs> After they had successfully clearly gotten away from the house and weren't even running they were just yeah. casually walking and he still killed them all <laughs> i had no choice Zach yells as tone loke puts him in the car <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that surprised me a bit I, I did like the line where rob schneider walks in on zatch he, as he turns on the gas and sets the match out it's like oh he's cooking <laughs> <laughs> he goes back at the report like he's cooking <laughs> i thought that was kind of yeah. funny there, there were a couple lines with Rep Schneider that I actually did end up finding funny um, as far as this. So at this point, they end up getting out of the house or well, rather, they blow up a house. They kill some ninja. They end up making their way over to Patasan at this point. And then we get a um, kind of a back to the Hall of Evil moment with Colonel Chi back over his thing where we get yet again another weird combination of tone with him. Also, was he sharpening a serrated blade on that wheel? It looked like, yeah, an electric knife, like you'd slice a ham or a turkey. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which I mean, like, I've never had to sharpen a serrated blade, but I'm assuming you don't just do it against a grinding wheel. It makes me wonder if that was a... Did the director and or writer... Was that in the script, or were they just like, oh shit, we need... What's something that he could be sharpening that's that's off off kilter? His dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this is where we realize that it's not good if he gets wet, his uh, his electrical components. Oh, that's a tool we'll use for later. <laughs> Do we assume that his hand just got crushed in the uh, in the elephant accident? Yeah, he puts his hand up to protect his face because that'll oh, do yeah, a lot. You're right. <laughs> or are these like three unrelated injuries? over the years <laughs> but potentially it just slowly it's like the old um was the the riddle of if you keep replacing the planks of a ship at what point do you have a new ship so at what point does he stop becoming colonel chi and he's a completely new guy if we just slowly replace each of his parts with cybernetics right it's like a billion dollar man he's more machine that now than man <laughs> i want to know the backstory of how an Anglo Caucasian man became the king and samurai of these Padusan people. Or why he can't seem to make up his mind between carrying a gun or carrying his katana. <laughs> right. Because clearly he's ineffectual with both. <laughs> How did he get to that status? 
<laughs> These terrible skills. So actually, so at this point, they aren't headed to Patasana. I actually forgot about the whole in the Imperial Place restaurant. How did you forget about this? The the arrival of Kelly Hugh into this movie. Um, finally coming in as Rome, which I guess that's the only time in the film they say her name, which I didn't go back to validate. But evidently that's a, an no, that's, ongoing that's piece. Pretty much. I would not have known her name until I looked it up like when I watched this two weeks ago. When I when the credits came on, I was like, I was telling myself as I watched the movie, I think that's Kelly Hugh. And then I had to watch the credits. I didn't know what the hell her name was. And I just, I was only confirmed because I saw Kelly Hugh. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was definitely her. But yeah, they, it's the, the first and only time they say the name. Which I knew she looked familiar. And I was like, oh, what else has she been in um, when I was checking through the cast? And Scorpion King, Cradle to the Grave, Lady Deathstrike in X2. That's um, what I remember her from as Deathstrike. Yeah. And then Mostly. she does a ton of voice acting skill or still. She was in Knights of the Old Republic 2 um, as Visas Mar. She's on DC's Young Justice as Cheshire. She was in Mortal Kombat, the games starting with uh, 10 and on. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's had a career. Yeah, overall, I mean, aside from probably Leslie Nielsen, um, she's had the the most interesting or kind of most notable career. Yeah, trajectory after this one. Yeah. Because she's the one probably doing the most consistent work other than Rob Schneider with <laughs> Rob Schneider stuff. Uh, so this is the <laughs> this is little Padusan that you were talking about. There's a, a group of Padusan loyalists that all live in this area and run this restaurant, it seems. <laughs> because looking at it, I would eat there. It looked really good. It amused me how through the fight scene that occurs in this location, how the game gear allows the kid to ch to to choose between all the different options and they're all viable enough that it would actually work because like, I'm going to choose the octopus. How in the hell is he going to know in real life what to do with that thing? Because it doesn't happen in the game. At least I don't remember it does. No, he just, I thought that was weird. He just, he chooses it and then just goes over and picks it up and, throws it on the guy's face. I wonder why he needed the game gear at all for that. Couldn't he have just ran over and, hey, there's an octopus, and throw it in the guy's face? Yeah. Sometimes <clears throat> having too many choices could be the death of a person. Analysis paralysis? Yeah, I think this just helps narrow that down. And he has the illusion of choice, and when in reality he's just following his destiny. <laughs> Surf Ninjas ends up getting into a weird bit about free will and predestination. <laughs> yeah, there's there's when you peel the, back the layers, man, there's a lot to this movie. <laughs> also, I like in this fight scene how they're all taking the honorable one at a time approach. Yeah, they do that. They do that a couple times in this movie. Johnny gets. I'm like, OK, OK, there's a there's a magical game gear. I guess I guess I'll accept that you've had martial arts embedded in your dna somehow and now you can just you can you can fight all right it's like the matrix <laughs> it's like all of a sudden it just clicks and he just knows but he did download all of the fighting training into his brain in which one the matrix <laughs> <laughs> the game gear yeah he, he, he looks at the game remember gear. the part where he jams the game yeah. gear cable into uh, the back of johnny's head <laughs> Very Johnny mnemonic. Yeah. So also, do you guys like how Zatch fixes his eye patch after every attack he makes in that scene? <laughs> I never I noticed not that. Notice that. <laughs> he does a kick and then puts like readjusts and then he hits two guys and then he readjusts. Did it does it seem like uh involuntary or like it was a choice to like have the eye patch be a thing? Uh, um, the fixing of it. It it didn't seem like that was part of the script. I think it was he knew from doing everything that the eye patch just kept getting moved. And he was worried about somebody on camera realizing that, like, wait a minute, that guy has two eyes. <laughs> so he was just trying to keep it under wraps. Yeah. Not enough coverage of the scene to cut out the, <laughs> the eye patch fixing. So, yeah, as far as this. So this is when they eventually finish up this fight. And that's when they finally escape to Patasan. Um, 
which I, I did laugh when Johnny is demonstrating his attacks now that he knows martial arts and hits the chef. That's that was in the trailer. Yeah, I honestly thought, honestly, Nick, when that came up, I was like, that's I feel like that was in the trailer. I hadn't seen a trailer in years. That felt so familiar to me that 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 scene. I don't know if I've seen the trailer, although I kind of want to now. I feel like for any of these things, we should post the trailer as part of the coming next week right. type deal or coming next time type deal. Yeah, that would be a good. Idea. And then you get to see how many things end up not being in the movie from the trailer. Yeah. Yeah, we should do that. Right here in this scene was another was one of the Rob Schneider lines I like. It just after the fight, it cuts to him talking to a chef like, so if I ask you to not put the MSG in, you still put it in there. And the chef's like, yeah, he just walks away. <laughs> I feel like that was an improv line, honestly. Well, it's his delivery about it. Like you put yeah. the MSG in, didn't you? After right. I told you not to? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just so like matter of fact, like, oh, yeah, well, that's that's how it is. Like overall, I think it was pretty funny in terms of some of the the writing with it. Which the the writer Dan Gordon had a couple good things under his belt, um, but between the, by this point and moving on, like Passenger Fifty Seven um, with Wesley Snipes, he did Wyatt Earp with I think Kevin Costner, uh, The Hurricane with Denzel Rambo, well Rambo Last Blood, but he did three good things, um, and then the director Neil Israel he did the writing for Police Academy, Real Genius, and Bachelor Party. Hmm. Before he directed hmm. this movie. So like at least Neil Israel had a background in doing pretty good comedy writing. I love Real Genius. So it it made more sense when I started seeing some of these lines that it's like actually it, it, it's kind of funny. Even if it's coming what from about the Schneider. director. I hadn't looked him up. He directed and wrote Bachelor Party and then he wrote Real Genius and Please Academy. He wrote Real Genius. Yep. That's a great movie. A terrific movie. We should do that one. I think, yeah, I would Actually, say yes. Let's stop this one now. Shoulders. <laughs> let's cut. <laughs> let's cut into real genius. Um, oh, the, another thing about this. Is it that, yeah, this scene where Adam with his game gear, he says, I beat my best score, yet he never played this game before, like yesterday, like the day before this. And it's a magic game. How's well, he at having this point, his scores? score is probably zero. <laughs> <laughs> so he can say that every scene <laughs> by default this is my best score <laughs> I, I just I thought it was an interesting he... choice like why did he say that like this he was playing shinobi he wasn't playing su the, the predictive surf ninjas game and how is it a yeah anyway yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> don't read too looking far too much into, into it. it yeah I know I know <laughs> So this is the point where I realized that Tone Loke is actually a pretty decent detective that he determined they were here. <laughs> I think he's a horrible gives detective. him the funky Cole Medina. <laughs> <laughs> is that what that move is called? <laughs> yeah. I just remember the Tone Loke song and evidently it was about knocking people out or it was like some roofy thing. I forget what it was. Not, not recalling how this movie went. I was... Really confused to see Tone Loke stumble out of the uh, steerage of the boat. Like they didn't, they did, they couldn't spare ten minutes to just take him back to his car, like to get him off the boat. They're like, "Nah, I guess you're coming with us. <laughs> Let's kidnap the detective." What if their intent was to just throw him overboard when they're out in sea? <laughs> they had to <laughs> just get into international waters where Santa Monica PD no longer applies to your or jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> he just woke up before they could reach it <laughs> they also I like how he gets out of the handcuffs because he eats his key every Tuesday every week yeah oh my god and he's not even a little bit upset that he's now involved in this weird ancient family plot and he's kidnapped essentially and he's like I, you know what I needed a vacation <laughs> this is all right well I mean considering his previous case was with Ace Ventura this is probably Kind of well, normal this, for him. This happened, but this is a prequel to Ace Ventura. Oh, yeah. So actually, this is probably why he dealt with Ace Ventura. <laughs> he just talking out of his enough. ass, dealt with different. <laughs> so this is a motley crew we have now. So we have Rob Schneider, Tone Loke, uh, Zatch, Adam, and Johnny, um, and Kelly Hughes, Romay. 
That's um, right. She comes ship along. To Parusan. Um, so as far as so this is where they're on their way to uh, the jungle from there. So I feel like this is kind of the it almost feels like the, the halfway point of the movie of them leaving. Um, but I guess it's like three quarters yeah. in by this point. This is the point where I kind of start losing it with the movie. Like, uh, I'm not a fan. Oh, I feel like at this point I was laughing more so at most of the lines and things happening from here on out. It definitely like they, got more ridiculous. They come into the jungle and then they're playing a song as they're kind of introducing everything that literally the lyrics are just this is our jungle over and over again. <laughs> Our hearts burn with fire <laughs> in our jungle. That's not a direct line, but it might be. <laughs> Why did Adam have to be carried? Like, isn't he like a spry young 12 year old? And Zatch is carrying him on his back. Like, only a 10 minutes after they land. <laughs> <laughs> what they don't explain is the game gear doesn't have batteries, so it slowly has been draining his life force as he uses it. Right. And he reacts differently in a different hemisphere of the world, like the sun is, is not as effective at recharging him. <laughs> so how'd you guys feel about the whole Rob Schneider thing with the money can't buy knives? I never liked the joke. I don't remember that line. He goes on and on for it. It's like the the... The voicemail thing with Rob Schneider, except this one, I feel, doesn't stick. I'm totally blanking on the joke. They're talking about the the weapons that they end up having. Um, and they're like, oh, why can't they? Like, can we buy a knife? And he's like, oh, well, money can't buy knives. Google it. Pull it up. I can't do it as well as uh, the famed thespian Rob Schneider. I, I trust you. Although it's at this point that Tone Loke proclaims he's going to cut a guy. <laughs> that's right <laughs> oh now that makes me remember he's like oh if i had a knife i'd cut <laughs> him yeah i remember that part yes yeah, something not even money can buy the knives of kwan su knives oh yeah seriously there's something money can't buy knives once i went to a cutlery store and said here's a hundred thousand dollars can i buy a knife they said no money can't buy knives <laughs> yeah i guess that's why you hardly ever see him around and uh, yeah i guess that's why you hardly see him around <laughs> on the third day of the expedition they came across a giant rubber plant fortunately they couldn't cut it down for as we know money can't buy knives walking around the plant they continued <laughs> on the shores of Patusan <laughs> yeah I mean I, reading I the joke though like it makes better sense it's just like is there no way we could shut up this chattering monkey you know I cut him but I don't have a knife <laughs> why is Tone Loke speaking with authority on anything on that island he doesn't know anything they go to that burned village and he's like oh they're probably doing this to send a message to us like what are you talking <laughs> you don't know what's going on he's just following everything by the book standard <laughs> procedure <laughs> they covered this second year at the academy <laughs> <laughs> the police academy hostile takeovers of third world countries <laughs> Anyway, I just thought it stuck out as like, wh why are you speaking up to the politics of, of this whole, whole ordeal? Yeah. Or th I think it was this scene when they end up falling down and he loses his gun, too. So at this point, he is completely outside Santa Monica jurisdiction. <laughs> he doesn't have his gun. <laughs> he has great... eaten his own keys to his handcuffs several times. <laughs> you have to get you got to get it. There can't be uh just one set of those, right? I mean, like, that's <laughs> really running up every the, time. That's really running. <laughs> he just keeps re swelling. <laughs> it probably is. That's yeah, good, that's, more than yeah, likely. Probably I is. mean, I doubt it's, it's not like he just has to buy a new key, go back down to uh, the equipment room down at the station. Yeah, another one. <laughs> they have to eventually be coming out. Damn it. You can't, you can't keep running up the handcuff bill. <laughs> on the budget this year <laughs> so yeah at this point um they end up getting their the sword they end up getting the um the whole money can't buy knives they get the weapon the four thousand uh, year old weapons yeah they do a whole little zorro thing with that some weird music into that scene and then we end up back at the evil camp where they end up having to do the rescue for because was it's it Adam that ends up getting yeah there's like the a chain, chain gang, gang working on the road Oh, yeah, because then that's when Adam. So one kid ends up taking the car and clearly kills a couple guys. 
Um, cause I think it was at this point that you're watching the scene and all of a sudden he just hits like two or three guys well, with a car. Well, before this, I mean, they're, they're creeping by the chain gang and he and the officer fall down some kind of, it looks like it must be a bobsled track buried in the hill cause they just slide right down the hill <laughs> towards this chain gang <laughs> with Adam riding officer. What is Tone Loke's name in this? Uh, Lieutenant Spence. Lieutenant Spence. Game Gear Adam rides Lieutenant Spence down this hill right into the clutches of the the po- the military, whatever Colonel Cheese military coup gang is. It says they have to stage the rescue. Yeah, seeing Adam and Tone Loke together this entire movie gave me... Um, do you remember Sea Bear and Jamal? Because Tone Loke did the voice of the teddy bear in that show. It was the kid yes. and the teddy bear wow. getting an adventures. I would never have thought and of that. And when he's riding in... him down the hill, that's all I could think of in this. <laughs> Because it's like, yep, yeah, same voice and everything. <laughs> that that show was gone to the nether region of my brain, and uh, you just brought it back. <laughs> you had to delete space to make uh, <laughs> room for Seabear and Jamal. Wow. Yeah, that was now, that was my Saturday morning. I'm cartoons. lost in thought on uh, on Seabear <laughs> and Jamal now. It's all coming back. There's another sexual innuendo here where uh, Kelly Hughes' character seduces the soldiers to come into the bushes and then Ernie Reyes kicks their asses and then he's like what did you tell them and she's like I'll tell you on our wedding night <laughs> <laughs> that was like the um oh, what was the scene in Kingsman oh the anal yeah at the yeah. end yeah <laughs> yeah it's exactly that so yeah so it's probably what she told them <laughs> that, that that was in the original script and then they had to cut it for time for another four minutes of the money can't buy knives scene you can put it in the pooper if you follow me to the bushes. Then they get down and uh, open up the truck and rescue Adam and Tone Loke. Yeah, because at this point, they like still even now, the action scenes are fun. They're. I mean, they're choreographed. Well, it's very kind of the, that 90s action feel. It's very um, like granted. Yeah, they take them on one at a time kind of thing, but it's still fun. Um, I think. It's most egregious here because I think uh, Ernie Reyes starts fighting them, but there's a good five or six of them standing around with machine guns, <laughs> watching their friend get their ass kicked, and they just don't shoot anybody. <laughs> what if it's because they all have guns, but there's no bullets that are being imported into Potasan? <laughs> so they've been all relying on fear. <laughs> like the movie Airheads, where they hold them up with uh, water pistols. Yeah, yeah, you could be right. They don't know that there's no bullets, so it keeps them in line. At this point in the movie, is it this there? So they're taking off. They rescue everybody. They're taking off the car. And this is when they end up throwing the the dynamite, blowing up a car. Iggy clearly kills some couple <laughs> more guys. More murder. <laughs> yeah. I, I have this written down. More murder via explosions. <laughs> <laughs> he also has the, 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 the swear of the movie, like the, the kid's movie swear. He's like, Adam, oh, you're driving? It. Ain't it bitchin? Well, I guess it, it's because, I mean, that term at the time wouldn't. Well, even not at the time, but <laughs> <laughs> at the time it was already out of date. But um, I guess it wouldn't have been a swear because it was just kind of a, a slang term for cool back in uh, what the 60s, 70s. I mean, the root words bitch, though. I suppose. I don't know. Do we, I mean, do you, we have you, anybody you, that can, you, uh, you could you might be right, but I feel like it was like it's a little bit of the edge. We got the, the kids' movie Edge still. Yeah, despite the fact that swearing. they just blew up a car full of people. <laughs> yeah. That's where they get their edge. <laughs> There's no blood though. So yeah. no blood. Although this <laughs> when they're lighting the thing, isn't this when they ask uh Zatch has the the lighter? And they're like, Oh, you have a lighter? He's like, Yeah, I smoke, I gotta quit. From Sherry goes, maybe you should get the patch. I laughed at that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the that only, was a good The line. only problem with that is he does, maybe you should get the patch. And then he looks dead at the camera and he's like, look who I'm talking to. And it's like, no, now you ruined it. Yeah. It's like Indiana Jones running, rolling under the thing, reaching back in, grabbing his hat. And then he puts his hand back through to give a thumbs up and it gets caught in it. It's like, no, you're already out and it looked cool. Don't, <laughs> don't stand around showboating now. You hit the line. I laughed. Now you ruined it. So at this point, now we're what? We're back at the camp. 
They've rescued them. Iggy has a body count. He can never go back to Santa Monica or Patasan. Um, they freed, this is yeah, when, they freed all of the uh, chain gang, all of the yeah. uh, slaves, I guess. I don't know what those guys were. <laughs> Prisoners. I, I, I don't know Colonel Chi's process. I don't know what exactly it is. His goal it's nondescript. here. He's, he dabbles in all <laughs> kinds of evil. Just general menace. Yeah. <laughs> So as far as this, uh, this is when Adam and Johnny get their prince headbands and they just kind of throw one to Iggy, too, because that's, I guess, how that's his character. That's how royalty works. <laughs> yeah. Nepotism. <laughs> and then we uh, they're trying to find a way to how to get to the other island well, for their we, kind we of can't raid. can't skip over the Padusan's first music festival kicked off with an MDMA fueled parade. Down the street, <laughs> <laughs> they're motor surfing. <laughs> they have a parade that the princes are back. I just kept thinking like this: they're going to like they forgot everything. They're just starting a music festival in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> just all of a sudden, they just oh shit! And then General Chi comes in. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought it, that's what it reminded me. Oh, we should have prepared. <laughs> the parading. <laughs> we did it. We're back. Oh yeah, there's. It's the whole villain thing. <laughs> but yeah, then. Yeah, so Adam, uh, they do the whole Adam vision where evidently all he sees in is the potential for any object to become a surfboard. Right. Oh, that's this. This is the moment where you learn, OK, he just has psychic powers. It's not the game gear. It's like, oh, it was inside you all along kind of deal. Then you realize, oh, it's not just a magic game gear. It's he has a power specifically. Yeah, which why isn't he the leader if that's the case? <laughs> He'll be the uh, Dick Cheney to Johnny's uh, Bush Jr. <laughs> when they start ruling. <laughs> so at this point, they somehow make all of their surfboards great, terrific. And then Johnny proceeds to teach everyone involved there surfing within, what, five minutes? <laughs> a montage? <laughs> Not even a montage? Right. Which I guess overall isn't a bad approach to a ninja or an evil lair, if that's the case. They probably don't hear them coming if they're all surfing in. The only difference being the fact that you now see a hundred guys on surfboards coming in off the sea. And they were paddling for a while. I mean, it should be called paddleboard ninjas. I mean, at this point. <laughs> they surfed for a good 30 seconds. <laughs> it would have been better if Tone Lok still had his gun. I wouldn't say they were technically ninjas either. That's a Japanese art like, these guys are of nondescript Asian culture. Yeah. And they never look like ninjas. I think it was just a buzzword. They they might have just thrown darts at the wall to, to get the title of this movie, and then they probably wrote the script based on that. Well, I mean, if they had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they probably knew that that was one of the adjectives. And it was either going to be surf teenagers, surf right. mutants, or surf ninjas. I mean, the turtles were aggressively turtles, aggressively ninja and aggressively teenage. I feel the teenage part was not really emphasized that much. I guess Mikey embodied that, like the immaturity, the immaturity of the group, you know? Yeah. But in any case, yeah, <laughs> in an hour they carved a hundred surfboards and, uh, and they're off to the races. Yeah, I feel like if, if that's the case, if they can not only make that many surfboards within that time, but also learn how to surf within that time, that's a better business than whatever Colonel Chi has them doing, if that's the case. Right. I mean, I was just like, is is surfing, is easy surfing like an Asian stereotype? I didn't think that was one of the Asian stereotypes because all these guys were just really good surfers right off the bat. I think it's just that's one of Johnny's powers. <laughs> like a proximity like bonus? A, yeah. It's like, like a an, proximity bonus. Yeah. It's like an yeah. area of effect surfing exactly. bonus. So Johnny teaches everybody surfing, Tone Loke, sure, Rob Schneider, sure, and they do their raid on Colonel Chi's fortress there, um, which is great that every single one of his guys happen to be turned around with their backs facing the ocean um, during all of this. I called this scene Assault on Precinct Patusan. <laughs> so the full fight breaks out when they hit that second in command guy. 
and they're fighting him and they knock him down the stairs. I was like, oh, and they killed another guy. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then like during the fight, all of a sudden they cut back and he's coming back up the stairs. I'm like, oh, shit, that guy's not even dead. And then they knock him down the steps again. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's definitely dead. <laughs> <laughs> Put it to rest. Yeah. <laughs> Which then it just like at the end end of the movie and all of a sudden he's coming back up again. And I'm like, oh, just let this guy go then. I don't usually laugh out loud when I'm alone. Like things have to be really funny or surprising. But when Leslie Nielsen comes out and he pulls out like the 38 special revolver <laughs> <laughs> instead of like a knife or a sword. <laughs> It was well, such I mean, an it, odd gun for him. Like it's, that <laughs> gun does not say power. Like it does not scream like power, powerful enemy. <laughs> it's just like a, a snub nose <laughs> out of his boot. So, so, yeah, all this time to prepare, and that's the weapon that he's he's well, got. If he had a gun, why did he attack the village with a sword in the flashback? Right. Yeah, that was my point back then. <laughs> unless it's, guys. Yeah, unless as he's losing his humanity, he decides like I don't need the honor of a sword duel now. I'm just going to carry a gun, which did great because a Game Gear beat him. That's right. Yeah, because at, at this point, like Johnny's deflecting bullets with his sword, like Deadpool. We have the Game Gear that's somehow able to beat that gun, which makes Colonel Chi both the worst cyborg and worst, worst ninja in this film. Yeah, he, he never flashed his power once. Like maybe I guess he killed a guy and then he got stepped on by an elephant. And other than that, we don't really see why he's that intimidating of a, of a boss, of a, of a tyrant. Yeah. Like if they wanted to make it like in the flashback, then they should have had him just mowing guys down. Right. Wouldn't been like a do not pursue Lu Bu type scenario of just him <laughs> d- dynasty warrioring his way through just hundreds and hundreds of guys. That would have been one of my favorite movie scenes in history. Of <laughs> Leslie Nielsen cutting his way through a hundred warriors. <laughs> what could have been? It would have been less impressive if he had the gun at the time. <laughs> Just His running Adam- through, mows down the first six, and then it's him just reloading. Adam's game gear doubles as a throwing star, too. He's a dead shot with it. He has that power. Because he throws his game gear and knocks the the snub nose revolver out of Leslie <laughs> Nose's hand. Leslie's hand. Which, sure. All of a sudden <laughs> he can do that. It's with like over time, they just slowly gear. give him powers like he's early stage Superman where it's just, what do we need this week? Okay, yeah, he can throw like a boomerang now. That's fine. <laughs> I accept it. <laughs> with the world they built. So Nick, what do you think about the, the big finale fight against Colonel Shi there? His moment of getting wet, I think, is one of the best lines in history. <laughs> Wait, what was his last line? Well, not his last line, but just like when he thinks he gets wet and he starts freaking out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm OK. I'm and then okay. he just resumes on. <laughs> gold. <laughs> Pure gold. And that is why this is Leslie Nielsen's best film. <laughs> yeah, it, it could have it could have done for a lot more Leslie Nielsen in my in my book. I can never get enough of him. In anything. Yeah. I wonder if it was a case of like they had him for a day or something. So it's just limited usage. Yeah, his scenes seem like two days max. Yeah, because I mean, he never leaves Potosan, so it's just him in his lair and then him outside, yeah, which they probably shot exactly. both outside scenes at the same time. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, it's a shame, but maybe it's maybe it's on the cutting room floor. We'll have to search for Surf Ninja outtakes. Maybe you can get Ernie Reyes Jr. See if he... uh has more insight. Tales from the set. We'll we'll try to get him on the podcast. I know at um, one point, the the actor who played Adam, Nicholas Cowan, ended up doing an interview talking about surf ninjas. Oh, really? Um, that I it was interesting. I, I can find it and send it over to you guys. But it's he just provides some backstory on some of the stuff that happened on set. I think that's where I read the whole thing of Nick um, Leslie Nielsen try to stay away from everybody just to kind of keep his mystique up for his character and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think he's the only one who left acting because now he does graphic design and illustration work um, for businesses. Uh, he gives some good stuff as far as this. So check it out. Yeah. 
We should post the link for the listeners, and I'd like to check it out myself. Uh, no, they can Google it. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Zatch, so Zatch takes a bullet for Johnny Ernie Reyes Jr. I don't know where. Yeah, he, he seems to be grabbing his abdomen. There's no blood. He seems to recover totally fine. <laughs> but um, Mac, this is where. Oh yeah, that's right. That he was holding the revolver to Mac as a hostage, Colonel Chi. This is where Mac comes back into the picture after being kidnapped back in Act One. Return of the Mac. Return of Dad. <laughs> our not biological dad, but our father because he raised us, Dad. Um. He's like, Johnny, you can't go alone. And it's like, ah, you never listened to me before. How can I stop you now? <laughs> it's like, he also never really loved you. Psych. Psych. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the 90s. <laughs> they did have a really, that one moment back when, before Rob Schneider was introduced as their Scottish uncle, where it was like, he's our dad. He wouldn't bail on us. He loves us. It was like a nice moment. That was all you really get of their relationship, <laughs> like being genuine. <laughs> John Lowe's like, oh, yeah, he's disappeared. Couldn't find the body. Psych. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Tone Loke. Come on, man. <laughs> when before Adam, you know, Adam uses his game gear to seriously hinder Leslie or Colonel Chi during his fight with Johnny. He runs and grabs the game gear right next to the revolver. He doesn't pick up the gun. <laughs> <laughs> he picks up the game gear. He's an honorable man. <laughs> Could have ended this much quicker. He picks up both. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was funny. I would, they seem to intentionally include it right next to the gun. Like, he's not picking the gun up. He should have. That should have been the hard left turn this movie needed. It is kind of a lesson because Leslie brings an M16 to a Game Gear fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Okay, one more thing. When he gains... When, so Adam gains like control over his hand or something, makes his hand, his mechanical hand malfunction. He grabs his balls. <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed in the shot, but he's... You can straight up see him grab like the outline. He's grabbing like his dick. Like, it's very apparent that that's his dick in his hand. <laughs> and it's a close-up. I was, like, I think, really surprised. Was that on the poster? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, like, I don't, I don't know what they were thinking, like, with that leaving that shot in like that. Like, you usually just assume, like, you're grabbing a handful of whatever. But it's like, no, that's the outline of a dick. <laughs> well, unless you guys go method. back and look at that. Leslie Nielsen is known for being method. <laughs> you know, halfway with this dick grabbing. I gotta tweak my dick in front of these kids. Like, oh my god. <laughs> so I like how my last note is just, oh shit, that guy's still alive at the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was not expecting an actual Barbara Ann outro that somehow just everybody knows the Beach Boys. Seriously. I thought it was a very big missed opportunity to use Padusan instead of Barbara Ann. Pa 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 Dusan. You mean like why not? They already changed it in the beginning. Because it was the Baba Ram. Yeah. I know, but they're changing it already. Now they're just going back to Barbara Ann. So why not make it Padusan? I think the brilliant minds behind the story were kind of taxed on <laughs> Colonel Chi and the game gear. <laughs> to tack on an additional musical number with a brand new song. I think that's that's meant for the sequel. Dan Gording sitting on the side during dailies, just furiously writing, handing pages over while they're still filming. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. musical number. Okay, <laughs> Leslie Nielsen, stop grabbing your dick. Musical number. <laughs> they couldn't afford Al Yankovic to write a song for the end using Padusan. So, what if he did and he's um, not credited? Hmm, that's gonna be on the director's cut. So. Johnny becomes king and he dissolves the monarchy and he gives power back to the people. Before they descend into madness. Exactly. I think it probably led to open revolt, like different factions probably started yeah. to struggle for the seat of power. 
They've never had a democracy, so they've always had a monarchy. You don't even have a, a concept of democracy there. So it's just, okay, guys, just govern yourselves. I think it probably really imploded. <laughs> it's, it's it like became a, an autonomous it's collective. It's the Rick and Morty purge episode. <laughs> but it's like, hey, no more of the purge. Okay, we're going to take off. You guys just got to handle yourselves. <laughs> and then like five minutes, it's like, you know what we should do? Every year, we'll just kind of blow off some steam and we'll call it the purge. <laughs> I mean, I like to think Pato San ended well. Like, they seem like a great people. They make surfboards. They kind of know their partying thing. They know the Beach Boys. That's all you really need. <laughs> it's the big three. I like to think Adam probably had his brother assassinated to <laughs> reintroduce the monarchy. To, and he kind of becomes the Colonel Chi, like part two. The end of the movie, like he has the game gear, you see the hand reach back into the frame and grab the pistol. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't done. <laughs> he takes him out on a surfboard. It's like Fredo and Godfather 2. <laughs> <laughs> There's a montage of all the killing of the, the prominent Parusan uh, <laughs> governors. There's a baptism and cut in as well. Um, and Iggy. <laughs> yeah and so what do yeah, you guys the, think oh go ahead dean you can finish your thought oh no i was just gonna say yeah then the uh the barbara ann happens and that's the end of the movie so uh i gotta say overall i had a good time this was more fun than i was expecting so point to you nick you win good good <laughs> I deduct Dean, what, the point and it's it just it's at a zero. You you laughed at maybe you should get the patch. I laughed at I laughed at some points. Yeah. MSG. <laughs> yeah. I think most of the magic was lost on me. I enjoyed dissecting the movie. I, I, I did have a good time watching it and uh, discussing it with you gentlemen. So for I can't, anybody. I don't think I can <laughs> recommend Surf Ninjas. <laughs> That's, you had a great time. You know what? Fine. Then everybody take the vote. Is Surf Ninja's screen refresh recommended? I'm voting yes. Nick? I don't think you need to know my answer. So that's two yeses. Dean? Nay. Okay, so it's not unanimous. So we can't say it's screen refresh approved. <laughs> but if revisit it, well, actually, if you've never seen it, it's it's enjoyable. I think it's you definitely didn't, you didn't need to grow up with it. It's just still a fun 90s movie, but it's clearly like, yeah, it's not great. It's one of the things where you can watch it and wonder the decisions they're making and why Rob Schneider's there, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and enjoy it in my mind. Well, so any final thoughts on this before we wrap this one up? Okay. I was no not, thoughts. We have no <laughs> thoughts. On this. I was looking back over my notes to see if there was anything. I, I didn't write any final thought on it, but it's like I think I gave you everything that I had. Okay, so ladies, gentlemen, that was Surf Ninjas. Join us next time when we cover, and then I guess we'll just insert whatever that is there. <laughs> it's it's going to be like Job Simulator when they just all of a sudden cut to a completely different voice. <laughs> Join us next time for Blade. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like, what if it's like, uh, and now movie trailer guy will tell you what's coming up next, next time. <laughs> I don't no, know. No, no, he won't. Cause that means I have to pay this guy to do a different movie. <laughs> every single, every time. single time. <laughs> going to be right. hemorrhaging funds just Not for him you. to come I on. mean, I would, you know, it would help you, but yes, I see your point. We wouldn't want to do that each time. <laughs> Let's pay for the million words and just get him on retainer. And then, what, and then you just cut and paste them like a serial killer's note. <laughs> you just cut in different pieces. <laughs> so join us next time for whatever it is we decide on. Uh, thanks for taking another look at Surf Ninjas with us. And we hope you either enjoyed it or at least you maybe found something new. If you hated it, take it up with Dean. I'm always here for your feedback.